my experience there was like you know, clergy and lay members um, were higher up and we like kind of like to take the best seat in the house and best rooms um, but then I got thrust from that into a very different culture and which was totally different for me it was a shock for me because I saw um, the ministers they didn't take the best seats they didn't take the best rooms they didn't go to the best restaurants and one thing that really struck me was that a lot of them just you wouldn't know that they were ministers because they came like you know in t-shirt and jeans and if there were cut-off jeans back then they would have worn them but uh, there were no cut-off jeans back then uh, but the thing was the one thing that really struck me about that was regardless of what they wore the Holy Spirit worked and it just showed to me that the work of the Holy Spirit and His work of transformation and His work uh, through the ministry has nothing to do with our, our outward appearance and like, like what God told Samuel when he anointed David, Samuel said, oh, he's the youngest and he doesn't look like a leader. And God said, it's not the outside, it's the heart. And I think that's one thing that we need to understand when we try to understand transformation, is it's not the outside. And like Jesus said to the Pharisees, you wash the outside of your cups, but inside your cups are still dirty. You're just like whitewashed tombs, you know, it's white on the outside, but inside are tombs, uh, or the bones. That's the kind of transformation that we need to understand. Um, oh, I just forgot, there is a reconnect, so if you're from age 18 to 29, uh, you're very much welcome. They're doing something, they're going to have a, um, a little uh, workshop back there, so if you want to join them, you'll learn something that you probably never learned before, okay? So, going on to what we're here to study, we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 12, but in order to introduce that particular chapter, I want to uh, just summarize what Romans chapter 11 is about, because if you read the first word in Romans 12, it says, therefore, and you know when it says therefore, you know what that means? Yeah, there was an argument before. There was something that was said before. Therefore, this is what? This is the thesis, all right? So let's go to Romans chapter 11, but I'll just summarize for you. What Paul was saying here is that the Jews were given salvation uh, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ but they refused it they refused Jesus Christ they were searching for life in the scriptures which they had back then was the Old Testament they were searching for life but when life came they refused to accept the life and that's what happens to a lot of people we keep on seeking life and love and we end up looking for love in all the wrong places, right? And then we refuse when we see that light, when we see that love, we can't accept it because it looks very different from what we're looking for. And that's what happened back in the Old Testament. The Jews refused life. And instead, God offered that life to the Gentiles through Paul and the church. The Gentiles accepted that. And when the Gentiles accepted that, God was using the Gentiles to uh, cause the Jews to be jealous. And as Paul says, in the long run, the Jews will eventually, or Israel will eventually accept life. But not without the Gentiles becoming saved first. So, Paul's point in Romans 11 is that God's 
It is by God's mercy that he offers life to the Jews, and it is also by God's mercy that he offers life to the Gentiles. And in the long run, both Jew and Gentile are both saved by God's mercy. And that's, that's the foundation for Romans 12. God is no respecter of persons, and God is no respecter of ethnicity or nationality. He is no respecter of race. So whether black or white or blue or yellow or green, whatever the race may be, God doesn't really care. The point is we are all one in Christ, and God saves everyone by His mercy through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And that's the foundation for Romans 12. Now let's go to Romans 12. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now every time I see the word living sacrifice, I remember a particular scripture that we've been talking about. You remember that? Whenever I read the word living, the words living sacrifice, what does it remind you of? Who's the living sacrifice? Christ. It should remind us of Jesus, right? Jesus is the living sacrifice. And we've been talking about the greatest love of all, which is to lay down your life for your friends. John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. So every time I see the word living sacrifice, I remember that. John 15, 13. In view of God's mercy then, let us offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. The question is, how are we going to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? Who's got a, um, a good guess here? How do you offer your body as a living sacrifice? Huh? Repenting? Living your life to following his example? Respecting others. Respecting others? Nice. Okay. It says here to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now let's hold on to that question. How do we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? Holy and pleasing to God. It's got to be holy and also pleasing. This is your true and proper worship. And if you have the King James Version, it says there, reasonable worship. Reasonable? There's another word for that. It's rational. In other words, when compared to Gentiles who, or pagans, when they worship the sun, the moon, the stars, or creatures, they offer sacrifices to those creatures or to those creation. And by so doing, they expect to receive a benefit from that deity. Now Paul is saying, these offerings, these sacrifices mean nothing. Why? Because all these deities, these gods and goddesses, they're powerless. They're nothing. So if you're a worshiper of the sun, if you, like the Incas and the Aztecs in, in Central America, when they offered sacrifices, they offered people. They cut open their chests and pulled out the hearts and offered it to the sun. It didn't mean anything. It meant nothing. They just lost one person right there. But it meant nothing to the sun because the sun has no power. But this is the rational thing that Paul says. That God who is able to answer our prayers, that God who is willing to save us, that God who is our Father, He sees our offering and it's rational. It makes sense. Because whatever we are offering, God is able to take that. But He chooses the kind of offering that He, that he wants us to offer. There's a kind of offering that we can offer, and if it's based on Old Testament, that's not the offering that He wants in the New Testament. See, back in the Old Testament, there was a temple. And people went to the temple to worship God. They brought sacrifices, lamb, sheep, goats, cows, 
they probably didn't endorse, they didn't offer um, horses. But what was offered back then at the altar, that was what they were told to do. But now in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, God says, it's not that sacrifice that I want. In fact, that's not the temple that I'm referring to. It's a different temple in the New Covenant. And who knows what the temple is in the New Covenant? Well, there's a temple. The reason why our bodies is the temple is because of someone else. Jesus Christ, right? Jesus is the temple. He is the light in that temple. Absolutely. And because of that, the sacrifice that is offered is His life. It's Him who was offered in the first place. And it's Him only through Him, as Hebrew says, only by that one sacrifice are all sins, past, present, and future, forgiven. And by that, just one sacrifice right there. There's no other sacrifice that can be offered that can save us from our sins and remove the conscience of guilt from our minds. It's only Jesus Christ. And so, He is the offering. He is the sacrifice. He is the temple. And guess what? Because we are also part of His body, then we are also the temple. And so the kind of sacrifice that God looks for is no longer physical sacrifices. Did you get that? It's no longer a physical sacrifice. Let's continue on. Verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Which is what pattern? It's the kind of worship that they have. They go to a certain place. They go worship there. And there's no other place that they can, they can worship. They've got to have all these these altars, they got to have all these sacrifices, and, and, if, and if you're from China, maybe you have a Josh thing that you place on this pot, and it's an incense. Maybe you spin a prayer wheel. Maybe you'll have a rosary. That's not what God wants. It's a different ball game altogether. And he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now the word transformed is the same word that is translated as transfigured. In the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus became white and glorious in front of Peter, James, and John. Same word. Now translated transformed. But be, and if we use that word transfigured, but be transfigured? What? Us transfigured? How would you like to be transfigured? But be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Now, what on earth does that mean? What does renewing your mind mean? Change from the old ways to new ways. Change from the old ways to new ways. But how? For what to what? And sometimes we come up with our own answers without looking at the word. That's the thing. You know, that's where we that's where we get off and miss, you know, we miss the boat because we're looking at the scriptures and coming up with our own ideas of what the word should say. Now that's putting our interpretation into the scriptures rather than the script letting the scriptures interpret for us, right? Can you look at the person next to you and say, stop interpreting the scripture. <laughs> Let the scriptures interpret itself, right? Then you will be able to test and approve of God's... Now, here's the result. If you allow yourself to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. How many of us would like to know what God's will is in our lives? Yeah, I do too. I want, I want to know His good, pleasing, and perfect will. How on earth do we do that? What I like to see is God come back down to earth with us. Well, He is right here. Yes. Here's the example. Here's the example that Jesus gave to us. This is the divine example. The Word was born to a poor working class couple named 
Joseph and Mary. And his mother was accused of premarital unfaithfulness. Now think about a God who's willing to come down to earth, become like one of his creatures, his creation, and be born not to a wealthy family, not to a palace, not to a king, not even to one of the high priests, but he was willing to come down, become like one of us, and actually even be born to someone who was accused of premarital unfaithfulness. That's the kind of God we have. It's not like all the other gods. Another example at the end of his life was that the Word laid down his life for his friends by being sacrificed on a cross, like a common criminal. What kind of God would ever give his life for his creation? What kind of God would allow himself to be tortured and crucified and the worst torture ever during that time? What kind of God would allow himself to be killed by his own creation, by his own chosen people? There's no other God in this world that would allow himself to do that. Right? Verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, and this is Paul writing to the Romans, and the Romans were not just Gentile Romans, they were also Jewish Romans in the church. He says, Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. I know it's in the negative, but it's still important for us to realize that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we are. And that is so very difficult for clergy. And when I say clergy, you know what I mean, right? Yes. Right? Pastors, ministers, people in, in, in position, in title, in power in the church. It is so difficult to think of yourself more, uh, it is so easy to think of yourself more highly than you are. It is so difficult to think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. If you are president of the company, how on earth can you ever think that you're lesser than your employees? If you're the owner of a large company, how on earth can you ever think of yourself as lesser than? You know? If you're making seven figures a year, right? How on earth can you ever think of yourself as lesser than the one who's making four figures a year, a month? And there's a lot of people who make five figures or less a year. And these people, the 1%, they're making seven, eight figures a year. <coughs> Same thing in the church. Verse 4, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. See, you look at your body, they have many parts. And these parts don't all have the same function. But who, who among us would like to lose one little finger? Would you? Would you? We have a saying in the Philippines that the pain of the little finger is the pain of the whole body. Same thing, man. Who, who among us would like to lose an appendix? <laughs> they say it's useless. Oh man, who wants to lose an appendix, right? That's so painful. And that's the thing about the body of Christ. The pain of one person in the body affects everyone else. Verse 5, So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Did you ever thought about that? That you belong to a member in Africa? That you belong to a member in China? That they belong to you? That all these other members belong to us? Verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, now let me just say this 
to the entire congregation. If you have a spiritual gift, don't let me stop you. Don't let anyone stop you from using your spiritual gift. Because the Holy Spirit gave that to you, you need to use that. Why? To serve the rest of the body. Now, it needs to be pastored, yes, but use it. Use it. Develop it. Learn how to use it. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, and this doesn't mean preaching, it means prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, serve. If it is teaching, teach. If it is, if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Don't hold back. Allow yourself to be used by God to encourage other people. Whether here in the service or outside or in the open hearts communities, use it. If it is giving, then give generously. Don't just give. Give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. Don't lead for, for the honor, but lead diligently to serve. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Here's the key. The key to transformation is to become like Jesus Christ who, who unrolled himself of all that glory that he had in the Father and the Holy Spirit, came down to earth, became a servant like each of us. That's the key to transformation. Remove those pretenses. Remove those facades. Remove everything that we think makes us look honorable or better than everyone else. Remove that and walk in the humility of Jesus Christ. That's the key to transformation. That's the example that he gives to us. Be devoted to one another in love. But honor one another above yourself. And that's hard. One of the best things that I've had in my ministry is not to go to a five-star hotel and not to eat at a very good restaurant and not to go on a first-class trip on an airplane. I've never done that. I've never had the opportunity. Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> and in fact, the reason was I was in coach and then they had an extra seat and somehow I was wearing a coat. And, and the stewardess came to me and said, hey, would you like to move up to the uh, first class? I said, why not? <laughs> <laughs> but that was not because of me. That was by the grace of God. You know, God promotes those He wants to promote. Because God loves us. It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. But one of the things that really I treasure in my heart is going around the islands in the Philippines. There was one particular island where we went around and I was not particular about where I would ride. I rode in the back seat of a motorcycle. We went around that island for three days just visiting every church in that area, one after the other. And one of the things that we also did when I was in Indonesia is we went to Manado and uh, our host didn't have anything else. They didn't have, a, they didn't have a bed. So we slept on a native map, three of us from the Philippines. We just came to visit and, and teach. And those are the things that I treasure. You know, just sliding up there on the floor with a bunch of guys that, you know, uh, are my friends and brothers in Christ and, and just enjoy the fellowship. I don't care about how nice the bed is or how nice the room was. It was just a room. <laughs> That's it. Nothing else there in that room. You know, just a room and a mat and two other guys and just enjoying the fellowship in Jesus Christ. I had tears in my eyes just, just reminiscing thinking about that. I would, you know, I would, I would want to have that again. So, 
The key to transformation is this. is to follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Let Him take over your life. Let Him transform you. Let Him put His humility in you. And give up all those things that, are, that we are clothed with. Allow the Holy Spirit to remove that. The pretense, facade, and just walk out in faith and let Jesus Christ transform. Transform you from the inside. Because that's the kind of transformation that God wants. That's the kind of sacrifice, living sacrifice that He wants. He wants us to lay down our lives and honor each other. Can you look at the person next to you? and say, I honor you, my brother and my sister. I honor you, my brother and my sister. <laughs> and it's just, not just words. Not just words, but from the heart. Let's honor each other. Amen? Amen. Let's honor each other. Now, let's not talk against each other. Let's, let's not think that we're better than the other person. No, we're just brothers and sisters. We have one father, one Lord Jesus Christ, one older brother. We're all saved. Saved by the grace of God, forgiven by His mercy. Amen? Amen. Amen.